Hey everyone, how y'all doing? I know, last couple sessions at KubeCon, winding down. Uh, I'll give everyone like a couple seconds, looks like some people are still flooding from the hallways. Um, so this talk is Cluster in a Box, that's the title on the schedule, so we'll be talking about. Um, we'll kind of be going over different ways to utilize different types of containers to deploy different kinds of Kubernetes architectures. Um, so with that said, I guess we'll get started. I have to catch a flight very shortly after this as well, so uh, we'll get going. Um, so my name is Rai Terrell. I'm a software engineer at Canonical, uh, the company behind Ubuntu. I work on the Canonical distribution of Kubernetes. Cool, and uh, my name is Marco Cepi. Amongst other things, I do operations at the Silk Road. Um, how many people here, I imagine most people here know what Ubuntu is or have heard of Ubuntu. I don't think we have to really give them much of an introduction. Who here has ever heard of the Silk Road? Yeah, right, like, there's like two people, it's okay. Um, I imagine most of you might actually know the, the community that this, this, uh, that this group panders to. Anyone here remember Pokemon Go? Remember that thing last summer, it was like this huge craze. The media stopped reporting about it, but there's still like a ton of active people. I promise they're out there. Um, the Silk Road's a site built to basically um, support that community. So if you've ever seen a hordes of people wandering around, odds are we're supplying them the data of where to wander towards. Um, and so we're the premier grassroots Pokemon Go community, um, which sounds spectacular for those of you who know um, what Pokemon Go is. You're probably more familiar maybe with other titles from Niantic. They produced Ingress, and they have a, a bunch of other titles that are very interesting as well. Uh, but it's an entirely volunteer run and operated community website. Uh, myself and the others that kind of lead the website all have full-time jobs outside of this. Um, we don't have like an income plan. We're not here to generate revenue. We're just here to make sure the site stays afloat and we don't have to pay money for it. Uh, we get a ton of hits to this thing. You'd be surprised how popular and how continuous our traffic grows even after the initial dull and spike. Um, these numbers are a bit old now, but we're doing well over 30 plus million hits um, and tons of uniques every month. And because we're volunteer run and operated, um, we have a very interesting kind of development cycle where we actually leverage people from the community at any one time. It could be just me or someone else uh, up to most recently we kind of ramped up for this upcoming, there's an in-game release. It's happening literally right now. I'm the operations guy giving a talk, but somewhere behind the scene, there's a bunch of code being deployed and I'm just gonna pretend like that's okay. But we've scaled up to things like 55, even 60 developers, and they're all volunteers from around the world. We have a giant volunteer organization for leadership and community management. There's a 1,000 plus research group that all gets together to collect and use scientific information to determine how mechanics work in game. All of these things are great, but it leads to a huge nightmare in that how do we make sure that A, we keep running a really smooth operating website so that we can keep being that premier grassroots Pokemon Go community? And how do we make it so that we can keep enticing volunteers to support and supply these things? And so it was obvious containers would be a way for us to really expedite that development workflow and still keep sanity from us who are all volunteering our time. So before I start talking about Linux containers, machine containers, dockers, and everything, I wanna talk just really briefly about the kinds of containers that exist in the ecosystem today. For a lot of you, this may be a review. For some of you, this may be kind of new, and we'll kind of walk through why these different types of containers are important and where we've found ways to best leverage those things. So this is a, this is a server, it's a machine. It could be your laptop, it could be a piece of bare metal, it could be a cloud instance of VM running somewhere. Uh, but most, for the most part, it is, a machine in the most traditional sense. You installed an operating system on it, it's Ubuntu, it's, it's Slack, or it's Arch Linux, or whatever it happens to be. You've got a bunch of processes running, you know, things like a NIT, cron, SSH daemon, loggers, things we've known to come and love as a core operating system processes. It's got networking, this kind of cute orange dot down here. Um, it's got things like disks where you can go and store and retrieve data from. And from here, you can kind of slice this up in a bunch of different ways. The first that we're probably most familiar with is virtual machines, VMs. I mean, they've been a staple for people from laptops uh, through to servers. Most famously, all public clouds are basically just virtual machines running on big giant servers. And virtual machines are just that, they're virtualization of IO. So it's emulation of hardware, emulation of firmware, emulation of all these bits, and carving out physical resources from a machine in order to have them appear as a smaller chunk of isolated running operating system. And it's an operating system, it's a NIT processes, it's cron, it's loggers, it's networking, it's disks, it's thing we've come to love. Um, 
Then we talk about things like Docker containers. I imagine most people here are pretty familiar with things like Docker, Run C, Rocket, the gambit of things that provide you with a Docker-like experience, uh, a way to manage and run processes in confined fashions. The most noticeable difference between things like process containers and virtual machines, as a quick review, is that virtual machines run all these supporting processes, an init process, SSH, loggers, crons, daemons, et cetera. You're just running your process that you care about and then the dependencies required to bootstrap that process inside of a Docker container. So you're not running a kernel, you're not running all of these additional ancillary support services, just the process inside of some form of disk. I like to make it inverted because you can write to it, but you can't really persist it. I mean, you can, you can commit snapshot, but they're really meant to be ephemeral. Uh, and you can attach networking. And most importantly is you can run these really dense. The number of Docker containers you can run per host trumps in the thousands compared to virtual machines you can spin up on that same host to do that same workload. Because you're not physically carving out resources and virtualization hardware, you're just simply confining and constraining a process. The last container type is a machine container. This is the natural hybrid model of a virtual machine and a process container. You've got a machine that's running processes, a NIT, et cetera. It's got disk, it's got networking, it's got your application. It's everything you've come to know and love from the last 20 years of Linux system administration, but you're able to run it just as densely, or if not as densely, very close or more densely than virtual machines because it's leveraging those same primitives that Docker containers are. It's not doing virtualization of IO, it's simply using the same primitives Docker does to leverage things like isolation of processes and stuff, but it gives you a machine context, a disk you can write and persist to, networking spaces, init processes, you can SSH, you can manage it just like you would a normal machine. Um, and that's kind of this kind of spread of what we see from containers today. So there's things like virtual machines, there's things like machine containers, uh, we're we'll talking about LXD in this case, but you could count things like the Clear Containers project. Well, not technically a container, is a, is a very similar idea to how to run really lightweight isolation of machines. And then you have things like Docker, Run C, Rocket, OCID, the gambit of different kinds of container technologies. And that's kind of how the space plays out. So you wouldn't necessarily, although you could, run an init process inside of a process container like Docker, but you could definitely, and it's expected to, and it only runs inside of things like machine containers. So that's kind of where we started. We said, okay, Docker's gonna be a great thing for us, but all of our developers, all of our volunteers, they all have different environments. We've got people from literally around the world on Macs, on Arch, on Windows, on FreeBSD, on every platform you can imagine. And to be able to present them with a, a standard development environment saying, here's what production looks like. It looks like this operating system. It's got these characteristics, this software installed was really difficult. So we turned to LXC as our first start. And so LXC was the, to us it was that OG Linux container. And I say Linux container because it's very similar to things like Solaris and Jails, I'm sorry, Solaris and Zones and FreeBSD and Jails, which all give you that same idea of an isolation of a machine. Uh, but this was for Linux and that's what we were using. And we found out that things like Heroku, the PaaS, I'm sure you may all be familiar with Heroku, their entire infrastructure, their entire PaaS offering is built off of LXC. So it gave us a nice comfort layer of knowing that this isn't gonna be some spiraling security issue or some problem where it's not gonna be compatible. Uh, also found out Pivotal's Cloud Foundry, the engine behind that uses LXC as a way to confine and constrain for their delivery uh, for their PaaS as well. So that's when we started. We started with LXC and I'd like Rai to kind of just walk through real quickly to show you all what LXC kind of looks like um, and how to interact with it. So um, Rai, sure. what do we got here? So um, if I run LXC list, um, I can get a list of my currently running containers. I have none right now. I can, I can launch a container like this, LXC launch. I'll launch um, an Ubuntu Xenio container, which is uh, 1604. And in just a moment, that'll come up. So what's it doing right now? It's fetching, I guess, the Ubuntu image? That's right, yeah. All right, cool. And so this, this container, this is effectively what we'd be talking about, where it'll boot off and use the same host kernel. It's basically kind of how you would normally do like a Docker pull and then a Docker run kind of a scenario, except it's pulling an OS image down instead. Is that right? That's right, yeah. So, yeah, please, please ask questions, yeah. 
do you reconcile the current? I mean, Bruce Zinni will probably have a minimal kernel. Um, yeah, that's a good question. What, what about the kernel? So um, this is an Ubuntu Xenial host machine. That's, that was great. that's super awesome for us in this case. Yeah, exactly. That's really compatible. Um, but what if we were to launch, say, like, I don't know, a CentOS 6 machine or a Fedora machine? I don't know. Does anyone know what the current CentOS 7 kernel is? Is it less than 4.4? Maybe? 3.10. There you go. Well, to be honest, we, we tested this. We literally spent all day testing these demos to make sure they'd work. And we'd already cached the Ubuntu images, so I wasn't expecting it to download it again. Um, so we would have been well into your answer already, because that was definitely part of the demo. Um, because you're right, they're sharing the same host kernel. So what happens with kernel mismatches? Turns out it's actually not that bad of a thing. Most kernels going backwards are fine. So as long as you have a new enough kernel, running a user land that expects an older kernel tends to not break. It's when you run a super old host kernel and expect newer user land features inside the containers to access that. We like using Ubuntu. Uh, Riot may be, a, I mean, we may be a bit, uh, a bit biased, but Ubuntu tends to ship very recent kernels. Uh, even in Xenial, we can install a 4.13 kernel if we really wanted to. Um, and I'm looking forward to the next long-term support release. So that's why we use it as a host OS, but it's not limited to this. LXC is a tool can be run on really any modern 4.0 plus kernel, kind of that's where the sweet spot is for these things. So 81% later. Yeah, another question. Where to download that image? That's a great question. So uh, this is LXD installed on top of an Ubuntu machine. Um, so each distribution that installs LXC kind of also can install a preset of like Im remote image repositories. So there's an image repository called Ubuntu, which points to a remote source that has a list of all the Ubuntu images. Um, if this wasn't downloading, I would have already answered your question as well. How do you see all the list of images? Where are those things? How do you hook into them? That's another fantastic question. I'm really happy you guys are asking these questions. It means I'm on the right track from a talk perspective. All right. Um, any other questions while we wait for the last 0.0%? Yeah. Hey, that's it. So, Rai, please show me. What do we have now? OK, so if we take a look at LXC list again, we'll see that we have a persistent machine with um, an IPv4 address. Cool. Could you launch me another machine, uh, dare I ask? Sure. So you used X this time. Do you want to explain why you used X? Why didn't you type Xenial? Is it, not, is it that long? Yeah, sorry. It's, uh, it's too long. They, they have a shorthand in the Ubuntu namespace I like to use. OK, cool. So that launched a lot faster. We have the image cache, so it takes mere seconds at most. And it looks like Humane Jawfish is now running as a container. It's got an IP address and everything. Can you launch me another container? Sure. But instead of Ubuntu, can you give me CentOS? All right. Let's see. So hopefully this won't download the CentOS image. But if it does, ah, oh, look how fast that was. Man, pre-baking some of these things are wondrous. Um, so show me the containers we have. Then we should have now an exciting piranha, a very exciting piranha. Um, what, um, how, can you prove that that's CentOS? I guess this is my next question. Just to make sure there's no doubt in the audience here. Is that, is that actually a CentOS machine? Prove to me that, Rai. Sure, I can do that. So um, I can exec into the machine context. And we can take a look at the machine. So Lexi exec, I'm guessing this is kind of like how you can Docker exec into containers yes, as well? Yes, very similar. Um, so I can do a yum update. Cat Etsy issue, cat Etsy Red Hat release as well? Sure. Red Hat release. That'll give us what we want. And then finally, to answer the last question, can you run a uname? Yeah, absolutely. So this is the entire CentOS user land, everything you've known to come and love and enjoy from CentOS, but it's running on a 4.4 a Linux kernel from the Ubuntu host, um, which is interesting, actually. But we haven't had 
any problems at all running different types of images. Um, Rai, can you show us all the images that kind of come available by default? Yes. Uh, we launched CentOS, we launched Ubuntu. What else can we launch out of the gate? Mm, make this more legible. Oh, yeah, that's super legible now. Uh, so for, the, for those of you in the back or those in the front squinting, like me, we've got, uh, let's see, Alpine. What else is there? Arch Linux, CentOS 6 and 7, all of the Debians you can imagine, Sid, Jesse, Wheezy, Stretch, uh, Fedora, OpenSUSE, Gentoo, Oracle Linux, the list goes on, down to Ubuntu and beyond. So Lexi has like a default image repository as a part of the Linux containers project, so they ship a bunch of these images. That being said, though, it's, you can take and create your own images, put them into your own image repository, just like you would maybe a Docker container, and distribute kind of starting OSs uh, or even golden images on top of that. So that's super cool. So this is how we started. Uh, we used LXC, and then ultimately we started using LXD. Uh, so LXD is nothing different. It's just a hypervisor for LXC. So before LXC was really burdensome, you had to like go and run all these long commands. LXD made it super hypervisor-like, creating containers, starting and stopping them, uh, migrating containers, snapshotting them, everything you want to do with a VM except at a machine container layer. It's just a RESTful API with either a local client or over the network, and we just integrate it into our pipeline. So what we're able to do is onboard a new developer, create them a new uh, container that they can SSH into, and then they have the tool chains that we use, they had the environment, they had everything that we basically have in production for them to play, break, repeat and rinse. Um, and that ultimately led to uh, a better velocity for our developers. So they have everything they expected, everything they needed in order to start contributing and being effective as a volunteer. Their time is precious to us, so the least amount of friction we can have, the more we can get from contributions. Uh, so on the cluster in a box, so switching tracks a little bit, uh, Rai and I had the pleasure of working with a really small team of people in the Linux Foundation to help design the Certified Kubernetes Administrator Exam. Has anyone taken the CKA K Kubernetes Administrator Exam? Yeah, wasn't it brutal? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, it's a really tough exam, but it's a great exam. I recommend everyone here go out, take the exam. Uh, it's super tough, but it kind of covers the gambit of things that you'd ever need to know in order to administer uh, a Kubernetes cluster. And that certification holds quite a lot of weight if you're looking for jobs or shopping around. What? CNCF, yes, and the Linux Foundation uh, that produces and runs the exam. So we had a bit of a problem when we were designing the exam in that uh, this is kind of what you expect today when you run a cluster. You've got a bunch of machines, probably in a cloud somewhere, uh, etcd, masters, workers, however you do your architecture, whether you're self-hosting, whether you're keeping components separate, you've got VMs running. Uh, so when we approached, when we were working with the Linux Foundation team and the CNCF to kind of design this exam, we said, okay, well, we can't use just a single cluster because if the user messes up on a previous question, we don't want that to impact the rest of the exam. One wrong question shouldn't basically dis discount you from being able to take the rest of the exam. So we said, we're gonna need at least six clusters. Um, in fact, we ended up with something like eight or nine at the end of the day when we designed all the questions to make sure that we had properly isolated all of these pieces. And the Linux Foundation and the CNCF came back and said, that's great. However, uh, this exam is $300. Uh, so at that price point, in order to run a five or six hour exam with the re requisite setup times and burn and review times, that means that this infrastructure will cost well over the exam price in general. Um, so we went back to the drawing boards. And I remember a talk from the last KubeCon. Um, this was given by um, Lynn Sun, who was formerly at IBM. I think she's now at its Istio. And I remember this talk from Berlin where she talked about using LXC containers as a way to do co-location of multiple clusters in a single machine. And so this was very fortuitous because we worked on this project over the summer. Uh, so we started leveraging a lot of those primitives in order to drive that as let's deploy multiple clusters in a machine. So the Linux Foundation CNCF said, you have one VM, this is the side, we're gonna run it in a cloud instance, and that's it, make it work inside of there. And so we did, we set up an LXC cluster, uh, we deployed all the components that you'd come to know and love, they are all isolated from each other, they all have IP addresses, you can connect to them, they're all networked up. Um, it was effectively like we were doing in a previous diagram, 
only it was on a single machine. And then we were able to take that and we were able to scale it up. And we said, let's create just a bunch of clusters. Let's destroy the I.O. on this machine and see how big we can stretch it. And at the end of the day, we were able to deploy quite a lot of consecutive clusters, all isolated from each other, all independent of each other, so that as exam takers move through the questions, any wrong question against a bad cluster wouldn't affect the rest of the exam. And as of right now, if you go and take the exam, you'll be taking it in an environment similar to this. So I'm going to have Rai take us through what that kind of looks like in practice. Um, this isn't the actual exam environment. Uh, it's similar in construction, but it would be disingenuous if we showed you what the exam environment looked like. So this is just a using similar technologies and processes, setting up something like that. So what do we have here, Rai? So um, I've SSH'd into an AWS box. It's in M4 2x large. Um, it's running five uh, Kubernetes clusters. Each cluster has about 10 machines um, for a total of approximately 50 machines. So if we take a look at LXC list here, which might take a moment to come up because it's a long list. What, um, and for, for those M4 2x large, what, how many cores, how many gigs of RAM is that? It's eight cores and 32 gigs of RAM. And so what's the monthly, if I'm just doing spot instances, what's the monthly cost on that? Like this is the most expensive, I'll see it. That would be um, $300. Okay, so this is a, I forgot the cores again. You said eight, eight cores? Eight cores. Eight cores. Yeah. Uh, $300 a month a box. So that's five clusters, about 50 LXC machine containers. That's right. Yep. Um, so this is a LXC list. So these are all the machine containers running. You can kind of make out that some of these are the uh, Kubernetes nodes because you can see the Docker and CNI and flannel bridges. Um, we could uh, SSH into one of these. The keys are already over there, so let's see. And we can take a look at um, what's running under Docker. We should see some kind of Kubernetes loads. Um, we can take a look at the pods, the nodes, cluster status. So this is one of the clusters then. It looks like there's three Kubernetes nodes in this cluster. It's got a three nodes of etcd running as well and some workloads, some pods, I guess, running. Yeah, that's right. Cool. Um, what's, the, so what's the resource utilization like on this box, I guess, is the next question I would have. Uh, that is a good question. Let's take a look. So the load's a bit high right now. I usually see something around uh, five, uh, between five and seven, but um, we can take a look at HTOP as well. So it looks like the 15 minute load is around eight. So at eight cores, that's pretty much about 100% utilization. So that's five Kubernetes clusters across 50-ish machines running on a single instance at $300 a month. That's right. Um, I imagine most of the bottleneck is not CPU, but actually disk I.O., or is it something else? Yeah, it, it is disk I.O. right now. Ah. Cool. Um, sweet. So that's, that's an example of how we're able to do things like using LXC. You can use whatever flavor of tool you like to deploy Kubernetes with, um, whether it be kubeadm uh, or the Gambit kubespray, uh, CDK, et cetera, to deploy a bunch of machines into a single cluster. So, from a Silk Road perspective, this was wildly successful for us. We were able to set up a bunch of dev and test clusters on a single instance uh, in Google's compute engine, which gave us better economics. And then we could basically test all of our pipelines with the same production model, number of machines, number of configurations, et cetera. And then our actual production cluster was the actual where we actually spent the most of our money. Um, and this actually worked out pretty well for the Linux Foundation as well. Um, cool. So the last thing I want to talk about uh, which is kind of the next evolution for us at the Silk Road, is bare metal in large clusters. Um, as you can imagine, we have quite a lot of code running. Um, for those of you who've used the site, which is none of you, you should check it out. If you don't, that's fine too. But we have a lot of supporting services, things like uh, in a geolocation-based game, it's most important to help find people that are in similar areas to each other. So we have lots of code that runs to help figure out 
who is close to you to help you achieve uh, certain tasks in game. We also have a giant world map which we help display where points of interest are and other things of, of, of importance within the game itself. And so because of that, we do a lot of traffic. And if you've ever tried to embed Google Maps or any other map vendor onto your website, you might find it's pretty OK. When you start pushing 30 million plus hits to those things, it actually becomes really expensive. It turns out maps and base maps are super costly. And so we are into a problem where our map vendor was saying, we can no longer support you at the free tier. You're going to need to pay $10,000 a month for your utilization. Um, considering we pull in less than 2,000 a month in ad revenue, that was not gonna be sustainable for very long. And I don't feel like paying out of pocket very much for these things. So we figured, okay, we'll run our own map servers. We use OpenStreetMaps. There's open source software to do all of these things. We'll take our, um, take our destiny, destiny into our hands and we'll build and run these things ourselves. Turns out it's super expensive to generate map tiles. Um, no wonder it's so freaking costly. So we realized that running it in the cloud is not very effective. We'll invest in some bare metal servers. We found a really decent colo, some good secondhand servers, um, two sockets, about 400 gigs of RAM, and tons of disks to store this data. And then we hit our next roadblock, which is the 100 pod limit. Does anyone know about this? Has anyone hit this yet in their clusters, running clusters? Turns out, as if we'd read the documentation, that um, when it comes to building large clusters, there's some limits in the software itself. The chief being that you can only run 100 pods per kublet. Now, for those of you that running decent capacity workloads, most average web workloads don't really hit those kind of things, especially in cloud instances where you have like four to eight cores on average per machine or less, and like less than 16 gigs of RAM. 100 pods in that space is actually quite dense. But when you start looking at things like bare metal, um, this was the average size of our server. It's a, a two socket server, kind of standard, almost white label box. We had 24 CPUs and 500 gigs of RAM and about 20 terabytes of space. And if you start dividing that up and saying, okay, I'm gonna run on this servers on average, 100 pods, um, that's not gonna work very well. It's awesome if you're doing machine learning or rendering farms or anything that requires tons of compute space but very little workloads. But if you're not, it's kind of awful. Um, and so what we found is that, well, if this is the model today, one piece of bare metal to one pod limit to 100 pods, uh, if we leverage that kind of same learning, there's a trend here in this talk, I'm not sure if you guys are sensing it, but we could leverage things like machine containers in Lexi to actually split up a piece of bare metal. Because we're not incurring any virtualization overhead, I don't need to worry about installing anything to manage my VM layer. I'm just using the traditional hypervisor API to say, give me four machine containers. There's no vert IO overhead, so I'm not limiting the resources on my bare metal machine. But then I'm able to slice it up and say, instead of one kublet, I can actually fit four kublets at 400 pod limits. We went further and started playing with different architectures. Uh, so we said, all right, well, let's do it this way, where instead of having this previous model, where we basically said, each one of these was pinned to a CPU socket, so two, VM, two machine containers per socket, and then half the RAM divided across them. We went further, let's do CPU sharing models, let's see how we can slice and dice and limit the quality assistance, uh, quality of service on these things. We got up to a 900 pod limit, we never hit that. I don't, we didn't have enough stuff to run 900 pods. And so what we actually ended up with was a mixture of architectures where we have one giant LXD machine pinned to one socket and then the rest for more general purpose workloads that are running alongside of it. And we were able to utilize about 600 pods per of one of our servers, which gave us a good sweet spot of density while still being able to leverage performance from the underlying hardware. These are nodes, so these are, yeah, this is a cluster. We have about three or four pieces of metal kind of split up in this architecture, so we actually have a lot of capacity for, for pods, but we run on average around, to serve all of our map tiles, we run probably 1,200 pods. Yes, it's the LXD itself. It doesn't see the bare metal, it just sees that you have, in this case, five Kubernetes nodes, LXD containers. Uh, it's less overhead. It's less overhead both in managing it and it's less overhead both in resources utilized. The actual residual computational processes used by LXC containers is managed in the fractions of seconds of microseconds of CPU time, where VMs, it's actually very heavy. Exactly. Yes, and then 
dynamic resizing, like we're able to reallocate the limits on these things. Like we'll say suddenly no longer are you CPU pin, just CPU share, or you now have a hard limit of memory. All that stuff we can do dynamic without restarting anything. Yeah, exactly. Yes? We haven't hit any. Um, we do this today in production. I know of a couple other customers that are doing something like this in production as well. Um, we just had to make sure we allowed and whitelist certain kernel modules into the machine container, so things like VLAN, IPv, um, IPv6 and stuff. But outside of those things, uh, we didn't, haven't had any problems, and we view this as a safeguard for us. We never touch the bare metal anymore. Uh, it's just very thin, lightweight Ubuntu OS at this point. Um, and we're pretty confident that if we ever got an exploit, because again, it's volunteers giving us code, we, we do our best for security, but we're also not PCI, HIPAA combined by any means. But if a, if a container did break out of confinement in Docker or whatever CRI we were using, uh, we feel okay knowing that it likely won't escape this isolation and affect the bare metal or eject bad firmware or something. Um, yeah. We don't use live migration. Um, I've used it in the past, but we don't use it here. We just simply resize or just delete machines and create them. Oh, I don't know. I have not tried. Um, might be worth a shot in a blog post, though. Yeah, cool. Uh, no, these are all connected to one cluster, just spanned across multiple pieces of hardware. So from our perspective, we've got it's actually just three pieces of metal in a colo. It's not like a huge bare metal footprint. But we have a lot of capacity that we use. So inside of Kubernetes, we actually see 15 Kubernetes nodes in our single cluster. Uh, and they just happen to be spread across these. It's, it's, it's almost as if we'd gone to Amazon, launched a bunch of Amazon instances. We're just simply use, utilizing machine containers to get the best resource utilization out of our bare metal. Uh, we've got tooling that we do to automate like the creation of these things so we can repeat them. So we just simply replay that automation there and then it stands up all of our little pieces and connects into the cluster with configuration and stuff. Yeah. Uh, we use the combination of stuff in open source. It's not super relevant. This will work anywhere. We've done it with kubeadm. We weren't quite ready for kubeadm. There's some HA and uh, upgrading problems. We wanted to make sure we always upgraded our Kubernetes. So we used a combination of things like uh, uh, canonical distribution of Kubernetes and some of our own scripts to manage how we do our bits. So we just kind of borrowed from vendors that install stuff. Yeah. Do you have any blog posts or source code? Yeah, it's not at the end of my slide, but I'll add that. I had a bunch of links in there. I'll make sure that link is in there as well, just some of the infrastructure code we have. Yeah, um, LXC has a way to modify profiles. Um, so inside of LXC, I can say, here's a general profile that gets applied to all machines, or this machine in particular has these CPU limits, these memory limits, even down to network and disk I.O. throttling as well. So all that's just built into the Linux kernel module for these namespaces, basically. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It does, it does a lot of this. We had some pretty unique architecture stuff, so we utilized a lot of the tools underneath ConjureUp to do that, but we basically built and scripted our own way. Um, ConjureUp works great. That's how we did a lot of our proof of concepts, but when we went to production, we, we used the same tooling underneath ConjureUp to do that, but we just kind of scripted our own way, basically. Yeah, so Juju's one of those tools, and then we built it on some scripting and processes to kind of map how we dynamically resize these Lexi machines, which says it handled in Juju. Um, yeah, so the end of the day, sorry. We did actually start with virtual machines initially, and we found that the density was quite poor. Um, in fact, we ended up seeing about 10x more density with the same workload on these pieces of bare metal. Uh, 10x probably more, actually. But as a result, that's kind of how we ruled out virtual machines and still sit firmly in the land of containers, just a varying range of them. Um, I think that's about it for our talk. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, I don't know. I, I think we're out of time. Yeah, we're definitely out of time. Here are those links I mentioned before. LinuxContainers.org for everything LXC, LXD. CNCF.io, certification experts. All you should get certified. It's a great thing to have. Do study before you get certified. Uh, it's like a 
four, six hour exam. There's lots of questions about Kubernetes from both administration and usage. And then um, that's that cluster large page. I like to make sure I source it. People know they always change those numbers and releases, but sometimes uh, just to make sure you have the latest specs on how big clusters can get. And I'll add the other links I mentioned to you as well. Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of KubeCon.